Welcome. I am TJ Hendricks, a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated and the Social Action Committee Coordinator for the Alpha Alpha Gamma Zeta Chapter located here in Phoenix City, Alabama. We are so glad that you have joined us for this week of education around the objective of registering people to vote and following that action with voting at the polls this fall. We begin our discussion with Dr. Robert White, an instructor of humanities at the HBCU Alabama State University. Good morning and welcome to another episode of Veterans View. Uh, today is a, going to be a very special Veterans View because we're in the season of voting. Veterans, their wives, their children, their family, everyone votes. So today we have two very special guests with us, uh, Dr. Robert White from Alabama State University. Uh, he's a professor and he's the head of the Black History Department for univers uh, univers well, Alabama State University. And also we have with us uh, T.J. Hendricks, Mrs. T.J. Hendricks, who is uh, a Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated Alpha, Alpha Gamma Zeta Chapter. And she's here with us uh, because they are working to educate voters and next week will be voter education week so along with her the NAACP and other organizations we're really pushing hard trying to get out the vote but before we start I would like to, for us to take a moment to think about uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, passed away last night uh, we're sorry about that uh, we hate that we lost her because she was a, a freedom fighter uh, as well so we just want to pause to say that but now we'll start the show and ask uh, Dr. White would you introduce yourself and tell our audience a little bit about you sure uh, my name is Robert White and I'm an instructor at Alabama State uh, University I have taught uh, in the area of African American humanities for uh, over uh, 25 years, and I have uh, recently uh, been uh, moved to the Department of Political Science and Criminal Justice. So uh, my formal training is in law and government, but my uh, experiential training has been in uh, African American studies. Um, I got my teeth cut uh, politically uh, in the labor unions and learned uh, organizing from um, AFL-CIO and uh, NEA. National Education Association. I served as uh, in-house legal counsel for uh, the Alabama Education Association and learned more political uh, activism there. Uh, I'm a pastor. I pastor Montgomery City of Refuge, and that church has been in existence for five years. And prior to that, I was uh, pastoring in Greenville uh, at Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church. I've uh, been married uh, for uh, 25 years to my wife, Michelle White. I have a daughter, Charity. She's uh, 21, and she is uh, finishing up her senior year at uh, Tuskegee University. So uh, I've worked on several campaigns and um, in political organizations. Oh, yeah, I was also the um, interim director of elections for the state of Alabama. I did that for a year and a half under uh, then uh, Secretary of State, uh, Madam Nancy Worley. So happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, and uh, TJ, would you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little about you? Yes, uh, my name is TJ Hendricks, and uh, I am a, a member of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Right now, I'm serving as the Social Action Committee Coordinator for the Alpha Alpha Gamma Zeta Chapter here in Phoenix City. I am a an educator. Uh, right now, I am um, a full-time Army spouse. My husband is a proud ranger and is currently serving here at Fort Benning um, in Georgia. Uh, we have three wonderful children who are um, definitely enjoying this uh, time of homeschooling uh, during the pandemic. And we, um, you know, we're enjoying this uh, 
opportunity to serve digitally by educating our community about voting. Um, I've also uh, taught at, on the university level. I taught at the University of Central Arkansas for three years. And before that, I taught high school um, back in Arkansas. Um, I taught ninth through 12th grade English language arts. So I am really excited to be talking to Dr. White today, uh, hearing his pedigree, and, um, and also being able to gain some knowledge from his 25 years of experience as an educator, as well as an activist. So, uh, Mr. Davis, thank you so much for allowing us to use your platform today to have this conversation. And Dr. White, thank you so much for allowing me to be able to interview today. Uh, thank you, uh, TJ. And uh, this is a great thing. As I say, this is Veterans View, but today we're going to have a veteran spouse be the moderator. And uh, we're going to enjoy, and I think you're going to enjoy this program. So let's get started. Uh, TJ, uh, you take it over. Well, today we are talking about the history of voting rights for marginalized populations. And um, when we say marginalized, we're not um, saying it in a demeaning fashion, but we as people of color, um, as women, as trans people, as young people have been marginalized in our country um, when it comes to, in, to um, our political voice and uh, being able to have actions put into place that uh, support our being real, fully realized as citizens in this country. So um, one of the first questions that I want to ask you, um, Dr. White, is um, when and why did uh, groups of uh, people, uh, our marginalized communities obtain the right to vote? And what, what comes to mind to me are, you know, black men, black women, white women, the indigenous people of uh, the Americas, naturalized citizens, uh, 18 year olds, and even felons. So um, if you can kind of give us that uh, quick view of when uh, they obtained the right to vote. Yeah, thanks for, uh, those are some uh, uh, awesome questions. And basically uh, it depends on the, the answer to the question is based on uh, American history divided into wars. Mm -hmm. Because it seems as if after uh, America loses a large percentage of its uh, uh, voting age population to war, mm -hmm. that the uh, definitions of what a person is expands. And mm -hmm. what we're talking about is being recognized as a person, right? An mm -hmm. individual entity with uh, rights, inalienable rights uh, granted to them by the Constitution uh, regarding life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and then applying to the 14th Amendment, the pursuit of property, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, life, liberty, and property. And so those things can't be taken away from you without due process. And uh, it was after the Civil War, and you can do the research on just how many people uh, died in the Civil War, uh, and at the end, at the conclusion of the Civil War, the slaves were armed uh, and basically finished off the war. That's a very uh, hidden part of American history that the uh, over 200,000 slaves were activated into into duty. Uh, mm -hmm. That's the movie mm -hmm. Glory, where we saw that movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was a major question about whether the slaves should be armed. Right, whether they should be taught military warfare, whether well they were, and they did an outstanding job, and that's ultimately what ended the Civil War. Mm -hmm. And so after that, uh, you know, the question becomes: Okay, since how they were such good fighters, since how they were such good, uh, uh, you know, soldiers and so forth, uh, impeccable records, uh, great shows of valor. Uh, you know, let's give them their rights. Let's give them. Uh, you know, rights under the uh, 15th Amendment, you know, which was uh, passed in 1870. And so the rationale here again is the contribution of war, right? So war stimulates a lot of things. And uh, again, it was not, it was during the uh, World War I where women played a major role, you know, in, uh, in the war effort uh, by providing support back at home. And so it was that effort that led to the uh, 
the you know the passage of the 19th amendment uh in 18 well, 1920 uh you know which said that you can't uh prevent someone from voting because of sex so um it's been war unfortunately that has uh that has opened up the door not so much a rise in consciousness because you have uh different techniques different fr disfranchisement techniques that took place to uh, intimidate uh, other people from voting. And so you have the Naturalization Acts that came up under the 14th Amendment, which um, integrated Native Americans uh, into, you know, into the voting process. Uh, and, the, and the question becomes whether they could vote in federal elections or in individual state elections, which is a, you know, which is a side topic. So that's basically it. Uh, whenever we have a war, whenever we lose a large population of people, uh, you know, the, the definition of who a person is broadens to integrate people who had previously been uh, uh, not considered persons, uh, you know, certain rights, which is which would include the right to vote. So as far as felonies go, you have to look at the Alabama Constitution of 1901, um, which basically um, took away voting rights of people who had been convicted of a felony uh, involving moral turpitude. And so if a person comes to mind, uh, there, there are two, uh, what is one organization, what well, have been several organizations, but I'm just going to name one, uh, the Ordinary People's Society. Uh, when I was the uh, interim director of elections for the state of Alabama, uh, I was approached by uh, uh, Pastor Earl Wagner, who's actually associate minister at my church now, and uh, Kenneth Glasgow, uh, who is the uh, head of the Ordinary People's Society, um, uh, about felony voting. And uh, one of the things that uh, that they they already knew this, and after I did the research, uh, I found it to be you know credible, and and then the process got started. That there were thousands of people who had lost their voting rights because they had been convicted of a felony who never should have lost their voting rights to begin with. And you also had people who were still eligible to vote, but the states were not making, or the counties were not making any kind of effort to allow them to vote. And so then you had people who had their voting rights taken away, but had to reapply to get them, to get them back and uh, there was a major issue about what the term moral turpitude meant. And because of that, you had uh, people that were uh, wanting to vote in one county having to rely on what a judge said in another county 20 years ago. And that judge defined the crime as moral turpitude, whereas the same crime in the county right next to it was not a crime of moral turpitude. So you had uh, what's called constitutional vagueness. Uh, so it was basically left up to the judge, you know, to determine whether you could vote or not. And so uh, you've, we've had several uh, acts of legislation in the past that uh, assisted in that process. But I think if there is one issue that best characterizes Jim Crowism, uh, I think it would be the haphazard way that the state as a whole and the individual counties have used uh, incarcerated persons uh, as a way of uh, propping up political power on one end and diluting political power uh, on the other end. So as a result of the efforts of the Ordinary People's Society and other, you know, other people and other groups, uh, the uh, law was changed and made more clear and uh, now we have a list of crimes that are Ooh. crimes against moral turpitude versus, do versus those that are not. Mm -hmm. And so naturally you had the application of, so let's say like, you know, with the uh, diversity or the inconsistencies in sentencing uh, between like powder cocaine and crack cocaine. Right. right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, th those have social uh, implications as mm -hmm. well. So, you know, so there have been, uh, major, well, I'll say as a result of those, the efforts of Ordinary People Society and uh, and those who, who supported uh, them, that's probably one of the biggest victories.
conditions of the case is classic. I mean, I would love to just come back one day and do uh, just a show on Glasgow versus Allen itself because it is full of, I mean, it's full of suspense. It's full of irony. It's full of, I mean, you know, it's full of, of a lot of things, but it, it in a nutshell kind of shows you uh, just how disfranchisement, voter suppression, uh, uh, voter intimidation, uh, you know, uh, all, how all that works together. So I kind of yeah. answered 100 questions in one. So. Well, I, I threw a lot at you, um, but you know, let's focus on felons for, for just a little bit because you mentioned something that's interesting. My brother um, also majored in political science and we were having this conversation about prisons in the census and how um, how prisoners are included in the census and how that uh, determines or um, uh, it makes an imbalance in political power. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. Well, what you have is um, you have um, the Thirteenth Amendment actually activated felony conviction as the new form of involuntary servitude, and you know nobody makes you commit a felony, but when you do. Uh, ultimately, you are classified as a slave. Well, here again, if you're a slave, your personhood comes into question again. And that's, that's theoretical, but, you know, it's, it's really important. Now, the thing is, is that if, if a person commits a crime in an urban area, right, in an urban area, percentage, percentages are going to say that that person is probably African-American, right? Now, if a person commits a crime in Mobile or Birmingham and they're sentenced in Mobile or Birmingham, but they serve their time in Elmore County, you know, and you look up and Elmore County has Staten, it has Kilby, it has Draper, it has Frank Lee, it has Red Eagle, it has Tutwiler. All of those people are counted uh, as population in those counties, their income is counted, their educate. So those counties can receive funds uh, based off of people who do not have the right to vote in that area, were not convicted in that area, you see. And so that is, uh, that's the three-fifths compromise all over again. You know, you're using somebody's body to prop up political power, but that body can't vote and that body can't take advantage of the taxation and the revenue that even is generated by them, you see. So uh, so it is a form of, 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 uh, of a three-fifths compromise all over again. And we have been saying that for 10 years, you know, but the question is who listens, you know, because uh, the, the it, it would cause you know, some would say it would cause a, you know, an undue uh, burden on the state to make sure everybody get a right to vote. It, well, you don't want to sentence them, mm -hmm. you know, and, and what it's called is called organization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I tell, I do different um, uh, events and ministries at prisons all over the state. And the look on those brothers' faces when I reveal to them that they're actually a slave it changes their perspective. Mm -hmm. And when you commit a felony and, you know, you, you're actually intending to do it and that's part of your lifestyle, you're actually forfeiting your freedom. Mm -hmm. And so we don't know what to do with our freedom. So we forfeit it and we end up placing ourselves back in involuntary servitude and the state makes money off of it. So, you know, the state's not going to do anything uh that will will kill its budgets that will you know will, will call, even if it's for the public good because we're we're in that state of, of anemia right now and have been for a while but uh i think you say your brother is, is is right on point and uh and he's not alone there are other people who are recognizing that and i think the prison industrial complex if you want to call it that uh will uh, definitely suffer a blow when you take away the economic science behind it you know. Yes, it is. Um, it's amazing to read about um, what truly, what prison truly represents, and um, and just even thinking about labor in prisons. That could be a whole different conversation about the wages, right. about you know, convict leasing. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Concrete yeah. leasing was major. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was the number one industry in the state of Alabama because, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, you, you, you would not have the uh, industrial boom uh, in, especially in Alabama, especially in North Alabama and uh, Jefferson County, Etowah County, uh, Calhoun County and others uh, mm -hmm. without convict leasing, without the uh, purchase of inmates you know, to do hard labor for pennies on the dollar. It's cheap labor. It's, it's the good. same. Yeah, it's the same as slavery. It's the same principle. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the point could be argued that that's why the dope game doesn't stop because the dope game is a mechanism. Uh, the gang uh, issue doesn't stop because that's a mechanism. You know, do whatever it takes to get guys incarcerated for one to five years, work them for three years, and then, you know, and and my dad uh, and his friends, my dad was from Gadsden, Alabama. And uh, one of the things that he talked about uh, and his friends talked about was, you know, how many of them had to go through prison to get to where they were or go through, you know, the county to get to where they were because they had to what, what's called work their time off. Mm -hmm. and that just meant they would grab you, throw you in jail, and you wake up on a work detail somewhere. And so you're building a road, you're building a railroad, you're, you're rail, you know, railroad, mm -hmm. you're, you know, you're clearing a forest, you're, you know, uh, dredging a river. I mean, you, you know, you're doing all this stuff and you didn't do anything wrong. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, you know, it's those types of things that, that have taken place and uh, could take place and are taking place now because you have the peonage uh, statutes to where, um, and that's a good court case too. That's another court case we can look at where um, counties will incarcerate people. And, so, and like I said, they, they commit the crime now, you know, yeah. but they make them work their time off by doing stuff. I mean, you know, by doing this hard labor. Um, right. Right. Uh, yeah, so um, that's it. Well, TJ. Uh, well, we could, oh, sorry, Mr. Davis. Uh, uh, I'd like to uh, say, if, uh, well, ask Dr. White uh, uh, two questions. It, can we say that then uh, our counties uh, are bidding on the prisons where they go in the state is one. Mm -hmm. And then two, uh, what do we need to do to educate our young people, 18, I say to 23, to encourage them to get out and vote? Well, yeah, everything is strategic. And the placing of the prisons in Bibb County, Bibb County already has prisons. Uh, Oh, uh, in Atmore and I forget what other one. Oh, in Elmore County, I think. Yeah, here we go again. That's another one. Yeah, that's another one added. And these are super prisons, which means that that they're going to begin to lock up a whole new group of people. <laughs> and yeah, they're strategically placed uh, for the economic purposes. I think the people down in Atmore were dancing in the streets when they found out they were getting another prison because because of the jobs. And so, you know, if you really want to help the black belt, you know, I'm not for, you know, doing it. You know, if you if you wanted to help the black belt, why don't you put one of those prisons in Greene County, Hale County, Marengo County, or Dallas County, or Lowndes County, yeah. and, you know, uh, uh, instigate more economic development there. But uh, the, the number one way to head that off is to not commit crime. That's the number one thing. The number one thing, the, 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 the processes of, of uh, raising oneself self up out of the gutter uh, is the same thing as fighting uh, racism, white supremacy, and so forth. Colonialism, it's all the same thing. If you educate yourself, you're not going to commit crime. And if you're not going to commit crime, you're not going to jail. And you're going to register to vote uh, because that's the educated thing to do. And you know you're going to be productive, and so forth. But if you're uneducated, you're not going to understand the relationship between uh, education and freedom. So you know, a lot of our people they just do not understand uh, how important knowledge is, and so that comes about as a result, in my opinion, of a of a moral failure of my generation. I'm 50 years old, and you know. We, 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 my crew is not a very good crew to, you know, 
to be hooked up with because we've dropped the ball uh, on a lot of areas. And one of those areas is making the relationship plain and congenial uh, between how much you know, not just going to school and enrolling and saying that you're, you know, I'm in college. No, but how are you using the knowledge to better yourself, uh, to better uh, your community, to better your family and so forth? It becomes like an act of duty, just like in the military. I mean, it becomes, you know, a call of duty. So um, to answer your question about what can we do to get people out to vote, educated people vote. And so uh, education, 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 knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. And so um, my opinion is to start with young people. And in 10 years, if you start an elementary school, in eight years, 10 years, you've got an educated population, but you have to think in the future, not the now, and you have to be proactive and not reactive. And I think starting with, with, with uh, those reinforcement techniques, the earlier the better. Take your kids to vote with you, um, show them a ballot, show them how it's done, have mock elections. I'm a part of um, a, a political action club at uh, Jefferson Davis High School here in Montgomery. And man, uh, y'all need to get this brother's name is Rico Cox, uh, one of my former students. He has a, a, a political education uh, group, focus group, that's out of this world. It's got about 300 kids in it. We registered uh, 200 kids to vote uh, in the previous, last year, uh, in the lunchroom. And I mean, it's just amazing. But that, those efforts have to quadruple. And I think that you'll see a significant change. Dr. White, um, let's talk about some of the statistics that um, surround the participation of voters and um, POC and minority communities. Uh, what, what statistical information can you share about the rate of votership with, among young people and um, since we've been talking about felons, uh, among felons as well. Yeah, well, I don't have any on the felony voting. Um, one thing that I will that I will say, and, and that's a problem. Data collection in the state of Alabama is a major problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, you would be, you know, it's kind of like, you know, you're in, in um, uh, Cold War Russia, you know, <laughs> as far as getting uh, information and and the data backlog is just amazing when it comes to public you know public access to things but the the, the 25 to 30 percentile is pretty much across the board mm -hmm. uh, you know as far as uh, African American voting um, as a whole and so I think one of the question was uh, that you all asked or that was sent to me was what what is voter suppression right? Um, well, that's going to be for uh, the next segment. Oh, okay, next segment. Well, mm -hmm. um, if you look at like the last Doug, the last election where Doug Jones was elected, right? Uh huh. And this is a, this is what I want you know, you know, you to people to look at when you look at the um, number of write-in votes that the Republicans did, and Doug Jones' margin of victory, it's the same thing. Doug Jones won by 22,000 votes, and there were 22,000 running uh, write-ins, which means that had those Republicans not protested mm -hmm. and not used that that election as a referendum, see, like when you have long-term goals, then you know you'll sacrifice an immediate one, you know, for something long-term. Well, mm -hmm. uh, when you look at those percentages, you'll see that Doug Jones didn't win because of the overwhelming black turnout because it was not one. You had large numbers, right? You had higher numbers, but the percentage, you know, was pretty much, was pretty relative, but the margin of victory that Doug Jones had was the same number as the right hand folks. So we've got to bust through that 25%, 30% uh, uh, rate and then you know you'll have like they'll, they'll include uh, special elections where virtually nobody turns out you know and they'll include that you know in the numbers which knocks the numbers down drastically but typically um, in order to impact change you're going to have to have at least a 45 to 50 percent 
uh, number of registered voters to come out to vote. And we're, we're nowhere near that right now. Dr. White, I, uh, in what way uh, did or does the U.S. government uh, contradict the Constitution when it comes to voting laws? Well, what happens is it's a, it's a, it's a failure to act. And um, a lot of times, uh, especially with the issue of gerrymandering, you know, there's going to have to be, in my opinion, some serious uh, talk and some serious uh, activism to undermine these gerrymandering techniques because that's what really does it. You know, you 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 create these black districts that are overwhelmingly black and it satisfies, you know, the requirements of the previous lawsuit that, you know, the way people can get representation. But at the same time, you may end up getting uh, an, another African-American elected to a, a district that may be 30, 40, 50 percent Caucasian. But the way that they draw the districts, that becomes virtually impossible. So I would say uh, by the way that they gerrymander things uh, is one, one, I mean, that's a major issue. I mean, Alabama Democratic Conference has filed lawsuits. Uh, the Black, the Alabama uh, Legislative Black Caucus uh, has filed lawsuits. And, um, and basically, you know, the, the gerrymandering and the court case that in my opinion, that's the is, that is a flagship uh, court case in gerrymandering is Gomillion versus Lightfoot. As in, uh, uh, I'm from Tuskegee, and so that was a uh, that was a Tuskegee case. Mm -hmm. And you know where they basically, you know, they just drew black people out of the city, and they had a weird uh, 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 polygon that they created to what what the city looked like. But gerrymandering is one thing, and another thing, brother, is just you. Just, all it is is just you. Just don't train people. One of the best ways to hinder the election process is to do nothing. Don't train the voting registrars, you know. And when I was working with the Secretary of State's office, my job uh, was to visit all of these courthouses in the state of Alabama. Can you imagine the pleasure of that? And uh, interestingly enough, my wife uh, drove with me uh, to some of them. And so she got a chance to visit some of the, uh, uh, these courthouses. Well, these good old boys and good old girls were very good people, very not, but they weren't trained on how to do their job. They were appointed uh, by the uh, uh, constitutional elected officials, governor, uh, ag secretary, auditor, treasurer, whatever. And, um, they never were trained. Well, if you don't know how to maintain a voter roll, if you don't know when and how to purge people, if you don't know what your job is and what it's not, then all kind of chaos breaks loose. And so that's, that is one of the main ways the US government and the state, and it's really more the state than it is the federal government. The states, you know, pretty much maintain things and all you have to do is just not do it. You know, you can have, you can impact, if you don't purge your voter rolls properly, you can have county pe people living in the county elect the next mayor in a city. You know, you had dead people voting. I'm sure you've heard of that before. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, you've had people who have long since moved away, you know, vote, uh, voting and so, uh, if you don't maintain good voter rolls, uh, if you are, are if if you don't tell the registrars what a crime of moral turpitude is and what it's not, they'll purge somebody from a list that shouldn't have been purged, or they'll keep somebody on who who long since should have been purged. So, the best way to to keep the election process compromised is to do nothing, is to not train, is to appoint people who don't know what they're doing. A list of protocols on how to do this stuff. So that was at least one of the things that I was 
uh, somewhat happy about is that, you know, my that was my job was to create all of these documents uh, along with the attorney and along with the, the staff, you know, to get this information out, uh, you know, to the registrars and to the election officials, the probate judge, the sheriff, the count, city clerk, and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, how to do these things because a lot of them they would come into a position and not know how to do it. There were a lot of uh, voting registrars that just did not know how to do their job. Yeah. Well, TJ, Dr. White, we're we're actually running short on time. Um, so uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Davis, were you going to say something? Yes, I wanted to say that uh, you have one more question before we go to the second half, and then we'll take a station break. Okay. Um, well, my, my final question is about the legacy of, um, of our communities and how we are voting now. So knowing that um, so many people, for our Black community, there are so many people who sacrificed and endured um, you know, some silliness in order to be recognized as voters. Uh, in this country, uh, what would you say, or how do you think that they feel today? Uh, many of those people are still alive today. How do they feel today about our, our record or our ability to participate in the voting process today? Yeah, and it was what they had suffered was carnage. You know, they suffered terrorism. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they suffered the, the, the utter destruction uh, of their livelihood. Um, one of my students sent me some snapshots of some uh, of some newspaper articles. He did it from his cell phone that he dug up in the archives to where it said people were killed because they would not withdraw their name uh, mm -hmm. from the voter rolls, and so they were lynched. You know, as a result mm -hmm. of that. So uh, you see the most horrid um, retribution against uh, African Americans for voting, but it doesn't take much to lose a generation. Mm -hmm. And when you don't uh, teach the history, you know, as a means of advancement, right, you, you'll have a, a very privileged, uh, uh, entitled generation to rise up who want what they did not work for and who will demand like the uh, prodigal son, all of their inheritance in <laughs> in one walk, you know, mm -hmm. and so that's what they're doing. They're the because we, in my opinion, it's my opinion, because we have failed. My generation has failed. Uh, the younger generations uh, don't have a clue as to what they're up against, uh, the complexity of it, the uh, intentionality of it, you know, one of the things that we learned in the post-civil rights era that we might not want to grasp, uh, if you want to call it that, you know, is the intentionality behind white supremacy. It wasn't a sickness. It is not uh, ignorance. It is very intentional and psychopathic in nature. And so we have to, when we teach our history, and that's why the current administration uh, took the position that it took with the 1619 curriculum, mm -hmm. which, I mean, you know, we could write our own curriculum. We don't need the New York Times for that. But, yeah. I mean, we got enough. I mean, I got, I got files full of stuff that we can use. But my point is, is that anything that reveals the true nature of power in America has not, it has to be dealt with. It has to be excluded. It has to be censured. You know, it has to be uh, yeah. eliminated. Yeah, and then replaced with a sanitized, as Cornel West said, deodorized uh, version of history that does not uh, incite our intellect, right? Mm -hmm. And our inquiry. So we've got a long way to go, but what is going to require here again? My my suggestion is to start with the little kids, and mm -hmm. and you don't have to interpret things for them, but you do have to expose them to it, and then let them draw their own conclusions. Yeah. You know, uh, when I was 18, 19, I remember my uh, 
my government teacher, Ms. Davis, uh, at Dable High School, uh, when she she registered to vote, registered us to vote in class when I was a senior, mm -hmm. and um, and then met us at the poll to vote. And we had graduated. I you know we had graduated, but she said I'm gonna you know we're gonna be I'm gonna be here, and I want to see you all voting. And so I went. You know, I was, in, I was a freshman in college, but I drove back to Daveville to vote. And sure enough, Ms. Davis was standing right there. And several of my friends who were, you know, uh, were there as well. And so, um, but you have to start younger than that. You know, you have to mm -hmm. uh, impress upon, take your kids to vote with you, engage in conversations. Uh, and, and we have to teach our kids how to talk. Mm -hmm. Right, it means that they have to they have to know what the issues are, uh, and and all of these terms that are being created or being invoked. Uh, most of the terms are meaningless, but you know you'll need to know, when somebody says like social justice. Social justice is a very nebulous term. There's only one form of injustice, and it's just injustice. It's illegal. It's unconstitutional. It's it's still unequitable. Mm -hmm. You know. Those are those terms I just gave are the traditional terms, but people will throw new terms at you as if they've come up with a new concept. When mm -hmm. in all actuality, they're talking about the same thing; they just threw a different name at it, mm -hmm. you know. And so, um, I was in a conversation with a group of people, group of professors, and they kept using this term, uh, 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 critical race theory, and I was like, critical race theory, mm -hmm. you know. And so, and number white supremacy. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? When it comes down to it, it's the same thing. I mean, you know, it's, everything is divided up into race, and race is the pivotal point. And, you know, Du Bois talked about the color line being the, you know, the most important aspect of the 20th century. So, you know, the kids being educated on what's what, you know, is important to them. We have to be intentional about it. Intentionality. So to sum it up, we start young, educate, mentor, and hold accountable our citizenry so that we can have real change in this country. Dr. White, thank you so much for uh, participating in this conversation. And we look forward to you um, also addressing the issue of voter suppression in America. Um, this ends our segment on the history of voting rights for marginalized, marginalized populations. And thank you for joining us.